Welcome to Inside Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white, but you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the place to send all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com. DR5 for the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out, www.dr5.com. Iger Studios, Lenny Iger, the place to have high-resolution scans done. You know, a lot of people now are shooting analog. They're using a high-resolution scan. They're making digital negatives on an inkjet, or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output, but they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints. They're doing all the stuff you need to get a high-resolution scan. They're using an Aztec Premier, 8,000 PPI, adjustable aperture. They can give you scans that are basically grain-free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lindy Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And, of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners, www.apug.org, the analog photography user group. The place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks. The community for analog photography, www.apug.org. And, of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org. The place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in their museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it. They have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo, we're going to have with us Tracy Storr. Tracy is the purveyor of mammothcamera.com. He has manufactured identical duplicates of the Polaroid 20x24 camera with dimensions taken off the original camera. Tracy's also running basically 20x24 Studios West by doing the 20x24 Polaroid work. Great guy, beautiful photography, really interesting work. And, of course, now he's manufacturing the 20x24 camera that you can actually buy yourself and go out and take unbelievable instant photography. This is great work. Tracy, how you doing today, buddy? Going great. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have you on the program. I want to talk about yourself, your photography, your background, your work with Polaroid, and this new venture you're doing with Mammoth Camera and making stuff and just doing a lot of cool stuff. So, Tracy, tell me, how'd you get into photography? I picked up a camera when I was 11 years old. My dad, ironically, had bought a Polaroid camera. My older brother was completely fascinated with it, and I couldn't get near the thing. So I went to Dad, and I said, I think this photography thing is kind of cool. But Will over there, he's got the Polaroid. And so Dad went and dug out an old Argus C3 out of the closet. He said, well, here you go, kid. This is yours now. And I went nuts with it. I took the ball and ran and shot a lot of chrome. I got into it. I really loved it. After a couple of years, we built a dark room in the attic, and after high school, I went off and went to the Boston Museum School. So did you take any photography classes when you were in high school? Did you shoot for the yearbook, or were you just taking pictures of all the girls at school? Tell me what you were up to when you were doing that. 
Well, I joined the high school, what, there was a photography club or something like that. And that led into the whole yearbook thing. And my senior year, I photo editor for the yearbook and all of that kind of stuff. It was going and photographing the basketball game or assigning somebody else to go do it. It was the classic high school yearbook scene. It just seems so far removed from what I do now. But yes, I did that. So Tracy, tell me about the Boston School. Seems like an art gig going on in Boston. So tell me about how that experience was and how that helped do some formation of yourself and your photography. Well, it is a really wonderful art school with a terrific photo faculty. Very liberal school, really out there. At the time I was there, there was not a lot of structure. A kid would come in out of high school like me and potentially just walk into any class and either take off or fall flat on his face. I think they have more of a structured foundation now for younger students coming in. There were a lot of interesting artists in the department there. Bill Burke was teaching there. John Reuter ended up there shortly after I started. He was there as faculty, obviously. Jim Dow, Sandy Stark, Elaine O'Neill, just a lot of really good people. I went in there. I didn't have any great message that I felt I was going to create as an artist. I was a kid. I liked photography. So I said, that's it. I'll go to photography school. That'll be fun. So the work I was doing then, it's really not very interesting to me now to look back at it, but sort of diaristic. I would carry a camera with me everywhere I went. Sometimes the camera would come out, sometimes it wouldn't. But that was the thing, was learning some of the technique and looking at other people doing interesting work and sort of studying what was successful and what wasn't successful and why. In fairly short order, John Reuter shows up with the Polaroid 20x24 camera, which actually installed the 20x24 camera in a studio at the museum school. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. They offered a class where students could actually come in and use the camera for their own work and also watch as John worked with various other artists that were coming in, either hiring the camera for commercial shoots or doing Polaroid artist grant work. So that was very interesting. And I thought that most people like myself coming in out of the street, just interested in photography, they don't know anything about the studio. So it was a very different environment. So I thought, this is amazing. I need to learn more about this. So let's talk about that progression. So you take this class, Johnny's teaching people how to use it, they're renting it out. Where did things progress from there with your involvement with this? Because I know at one point you went to work for Polaroid. Well, after taking the class, I thought the studio was this amazing environment. I thought there were a lot of things that I could learn there that I didn't see myself learning in the other classes. The other classes were great and I learned a lot there, but the studio was a very different environment. And one day the phone rang and I answered the phone. It was Robert Frank who was coming up for a shoot from New York. And I just thought, this is a really neat place. So I started hanging around the studio in between classes. And initially, John would just have me turning the room lights on and off or going for a coffee run. So I would do that. And shortly, I was watching and learning more and started stepping in and helping with the camera. I have one person standing by the front of the camera to raise and lower the front standard, open and close the lens, stuff like that. I would do that while John would focus and compose and do the other adjustments. Then one day he said, well, go ahead and set up as much as you can, as much as you feel comfortable with. I got to go down to the business office and drop off some checks. And he came back up and I had a print on the wall. And he said, I didn't know you knew how to do that. Well, obviously it's the first time I've done it, but it came out okay. So from that point, I started helping more on the camera and they created a job for me, just like a college work study because I was on financial aid. So I said, well, if you're going to hang out in the studio, might as well get paid and get a little credit for it. So I continued doing that. And eventually John moved the studio to New York. I stayed on in Boston, and a little while after he moved to New York, I took over the Boston studio, January 89. By that time, the studio had actually moved over to Mass College of Art, and I ran the studio there both for Polaroid and Mass College of Art, where they still have a studio now, and I was also running camera for Polaroid. I was teaching the class that I had attended as a student when John was teaching it, and then around 1997, a situation arose where I had an opportunity to have a camera here in California and try to make a go of that. So basically you worked the whole time at the studio and teaching and doing the stuff in Boston, and then you just said, okay, well, I'm done with Boston. I want to go to California. In retrospect, yeah, it wasn't quite like that. What happened was that one of the first prototypes for a 20 by 24 camera that Polaroid made in the 70s sort of showed up. It had sort of been squirreled away in some storeroom somewhere, and it just sort of showed up on the scene. And there was talk of, well, what's going to happen with this camera? And it was missing parts, and it wasn't complete, and it wasn't working. So Polaroid had a fellow named Vern McClish, actually, who was working in Polaroid's OEM group. He contracted Wisner to build a new front end for the camera because there was no camera on the camera. There was a stand and a processor. So Wisner actually made a beautiful mahogany and brass front end for the camera so we could actually hang a lens on it and have dark in the middle between the lens and the film. And there was talk of loaning that camera to Calumet Photographic. 
at that time, Calumet was about to open a new store in San Francisco. And they thought, well, we could have a studio in that store, and we could have the camera in the studio. And they pictured San Francisco as this great art town, which it is. And they thought, well, that would be a great place for us to have a 20 by 24 studio. So they conspired to do that, and Calumet approached me to relocate and open that studio for them. So I accepted that position and relocated and came out here, and the situation was pretty neat. president of Calumet at the time, Kathy Hood, hired me for this position. But the problem was, at the same time, Calumet was expanding. They were opening new stores all over the country. They were trying to figure out how to sell online to compete with the online competitors and the other big stores in the country. They were trying to figure out what to do about digital cameras. There was a lot of stuff going on in photography. I mean, at this time, 97, digital was getting bigger every nanosecond. So they were trying to figure out what to do. As the whole scenario played out, Calumet wasn't able to do with 20 by 24 what had been envisioned when we started. So finally, in 2001, I made an agreement with Polaroid and just opened my own business with the camera that had been at Calumet. So San Francisco didn't turn out to be the photographic environment that Polaroid had envisioned, or did it just be the fact that Calumet pretty much dropped the ball and at that point didn't care? I think the original vision Kathy and I had, I don't think other people in the company kind of knew what the plan was. It was supposed to be like a whole company project from the beginning. So as things worked out, they just weren't able to commit the resources they needed to. I have at times thought, oh, it's all their fault. Oh, it's all my fault. Whose fault is it today? It just didn't work out. Ideally, we would have been able to be more mobile with the camera, to buy a truck and to drive it to Seattle or drive it to Los Angeles or park it in Los Angeles for a month and do things like that. But it just got very complicated very quickly. But that's fine. I learned a lot from the experience and made a lot of good friends, both inside Calumet and in the West Coast photo community at large. You start your own gig. You got this own gig going. You got this monster camera. You still had film. Things were more economically (laughs) priced at the time to shoot. Well, actually, I had to buy all the film that Calumet had in inventory out of my own pocket. That hurt. But it was a lot cheaper then than it is now. (laughs) It was a lot cheaper. (laughs) I bet you wish you could buy some more at the same price, huh? Oh, that would be a beautiful (laughs) thing, because as you know now, film's 200 a shot. And what was it back then? How much was it a case? $200 a case? Oh, no. It was more than that. But I think the retail price of the film was somewhere around $50 a shot, nine, right. ten years ago. So, yeah, it was around a quarter of what it is today. Right. But, I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. The film is no longer being made. Although 20 by 24 Holdings back east, they're currently involved in making new chemicals to revitalize the supply that we've got. The film lasts sort of indefinitely, but the chemical packs go bad. So with John's new ability to make new pods, we've basically got a revitalized fresh film supply to carry us through the next couple of years. And hopefully someone else will step up and make some emulsion when the time needs to be. Maybe some beautiful mm-hmm. Fuji color. Yeah, whether it's Fuji or Impossible Project. I mean, it would be great if Fuji would step up because obviously they're already in the business of making instant film. So I wouldn't think it would be too terribly difficult for them to spool up some big material. I think if so, someone came to the one with enough cash, they would love to spool up and give you the whole master roll. The bundle of cash, that's the real trick now, isn't <laughs> it? It'll be cool to see how this whole thing plays out. Right now, we do have a nice inventory of the films that we know real well that we've been shooting for years. And it's real Polaroid stuff, man. It's the last it is on the, the real planet. Deal. Yeah, Polacolor 3. I mean, I've got a lot of clients who are waiting to see Polacolor 3 again because they do image transfer. And I know people are experimenting with the Fuji film, doing transfer with that. But that's the material that image transfer started with, and people know what it looks like, and they know how to do it. So, I mean, I've got clients who only do image transfer, and they're sitting around waiting, when's the new film coming, Trace? So it's really exciting. That is good. So you still have a clientele that's still actively seeking and wanting to rent the camera and shoot this incredible, historic Polaroid process. I do, yeah. It's a smaller client base than it was a couple years ago. I mean, certainly with the ebb and flow of the economy, the phone rings less often or more often with people asking. Things were real quiet there for a while, where just people weren't even calling to ask, the cameras still exist? But I'm getting more inquiries now, both with existing clients and with new clients, people calling to say, hey, what's going on? The one that cracks me up is that people will call me and they go, oh, I never bothered calling you because I figured you had a waiting list. It would be a great tagline, Polaroid 20 by 24, what are you waiting for? It is this amazing instant photography that two minutes after you click the shutter, you've got your result. Then you can react to it and decide what to do next. So people can rent the camera. You have a location. Is it that they can take it out in the field? I mean, how does this work if you're on the West Coast? And I know that John and those guys in New York and Boston are doing their stuff, but let's talk about people here on the West. 
So well, how does it work with you guys? Well, with the real estate market out here the way it is and the way that the rental business has not blown me out of the water yet, it would always be nice to see things turn around and suddenly become an overnight success. But what I've been doing since leaving Calumet is I keep the camera at a day rental studio. There's a wonderful studio here in San Francisco called Left Space Studio, and it's really sort of the premier rental studio in San Francisco. And it happens to be next door to Calumet. They're not related, but it's owned by a photographer named R.J. Muna, and it's a beautiful space. He's got four shooting bays there, the smallest of which is something like 950 square feet, and the biggest studio is Studio Black, which is 3,800 square feet with a giant two-wall psych and a drive-in door, so you can shoot cars in there. So when I've got to shoot, I've got a fabulous place to shoot. I've got a base rate price for renting the camera, and people need extras. We've got a fully stocked equipment room with pro photo lights and Calumet next door for anything we don't have. So it can be as a la carte or comprehensive as we want. But most of the shoots we do can happen in a really small space. I mean, you've seen, John, the 20 by 24 studio in New York. It's a beautiful space, but in terms of the actual shooting area, on any given day, they're using maybe a third of it. And that's the thing I found. And the majority of our shoots can happen actually in a quite modest space. From time to time, I end up putting the camera in a truck and driving down to Los Angeles and shoot in various studios in Los Angeles or various locations in Los Angeles. I've shot at Gagosian Gallery, actually in the gallery space with Julian Schnabel. For a number of years, I took the camera every year to the Independent Spirit Awards and set the camera up in a tent on the beach in Santa Monica and shot celebrities and directors for InStyle magazine. And that was a fun gig. But there was a big editorial shakeup there a couple of years ago, and I think the magazine is also no longer a sponsor of that event. So that was the end of my nine-year run at the Spirit Awards, which is a shame. It was sort of my favorite gig all year. No, that is cool. Tell me about the stuff you've done with Tim Burton. I think it's pretty cool. Well, John shot with Tim Burton in Death Valley many, many years ago. But more recently, I had a shoot with Mary Ellen Mark and Tim Burton. Tim is directing Disney's Alice in Wonderland. And a lot of people don't know, Mary Ellen Mark has done a lot of behind-the-scenes production stills on movies. In fact, she had a book out a few months ago, I think it's called Behind the Scene. Fabulous book, showing Mary Ellen's work of working with Fellini and shooting Marlon Brando on Apocalypse Now. Just more stuff than I can rattle off the top of my head. And I've shot with Mary Ellen a few times. She's a client. She's started shooting with John. And she's done a lot of work with Tim Burton over the years. So when Tim was going to be doing Alice in Wonderland, they got together and they decided, well, let's bring the 20 by 24 down. So we brought the 20 by 24 down from San Francisco. I just loaded it into a rented van and drove down. Mary Ellen shot a mix of medium format and 20 by 24. So we had Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter and Crispin Glover and all the other stars of the movie. And they would come in in full hair and makeup and we would blast away with the 20 by 24. So it was pretty neat. I had never met Tim Burton before that. And he's a pretty cool guy. It's always fun to be around people who are interested in the process, interested in the camera, and enthusiastic for it. I mean, it doesn't get better than that, than to be working with people who just love what they're doing. So they were all pretty keen on the Polaroid photography and the whole instant gig? Yeah, well, it's a great medium for photographing celebrities because they're in front of cameras. They've got cameras up their nose all day, every day. Not you know, one of those. Exactly. But I mean, the beauty of it is that we do get this instant feedback. I mean, people talk about instant gratification, but it's really instant feedback. And two minutes after clicking the shutter, you've got this print on the wall. And so it's a real collaboration where if you get Johnny Depp or somebody, a lot of these guys, they would ordinarily be over it. Okay, you've had your click, click, I'm out of here. But with this, they really become part of the process and they go, oh, I understand what you're doing there. I can literally see it. And a lot of times you end up getting where you would have had nine and a half minutes with somebody because they can see what you're doing and it becomes this interplay. Sometimes they hang around a lot longer than you were supposed to have them for. Their handlers or wranglers are saying, time to go. Oh, no, no, this is okay. We're going to stay here for a while. Have you ever shot one of these guys on one of these movie gigs or had someone that was so intrigued or like, dude, can you shoot another one for me now? That has happened when we were doing the Spirit Award shoots. And the problem there was we were under such a time crunch. There were short windows when we were able to get people. So we would shoot them. And for the most part, when I did the Spirit Award shoot, I would be working with different photographers Over the course of nine years, I worked with three or four different photographers, from Susan Schachter to Greg Heisler to Nigel Perry to Jock Sturgis. We actually shot the Spirit Awards with Jock Sturgis one year. It was great, because also he's a large format photographer, so he gets it. Yeah, but people would come in and they go, wow, this camera is so cool. And it was always refreshing to hear that from somebody like Elijah Wood 
or Brendan Fraser or these actors that you pay money to go see them on the screen. And then they walk into your makeshift studio tent and they go, wow, that's a really cool camera. William H. Macy was another one. He came in and he just stood there looking at the camera like, that thing is really neat. So it's a lot of fun to share it with people. So Tracy, let's talk about your photography, what you're doing these days. Are you shooting anything on the Polaroid? Are you doing traditional process? Tell me what Tracy's doing. I mean, I know you had the Argus when you were a kid. You were shooting chrome. Everything was Mm -hmm. cool, but what happened between? What have you been shooting? For a long time, I was only using the Polaroid and helping other people do their work. In the 90s, I kind of wanted to get out of it. I was in the studio all the time with my students or with my clients, when everything is just controlled to the nth degree. So I started doing pinhole photography. I took a cigar box and some leftover decking from redoing my porch and made myself a pinhole camera that took a 4x5 film holder and had a tripod mount in the bottom. And I went around Boston and I shot pinhole photographs. Then I would bring those back. I was shooting chrome because somebody gave me a bunch for free. So that gave me a chance to figure out my exposures because obviously with chrome film, you've got to kind of nail it. So I was out with a pinhole camera and a spot meter and shooting chrome. Then I would take the chromes back and take them into the darkroom and put them in the enlarger and make 8x10. In some cases, I was doing color separation sets or sometimes just enlarged negatives for single color. I was doing a lot of multiple gum printing over cyanotype and over Van Dyke Brown. And then I got the call to move to California. So my personal work screeched to a halt again. After a couple of years of kind of getting settled and trying to figure out what was going on, I picked up a 5x7 Deerdorf and started doing a lot of still life work which I would work all day at Calumet, either in the studio or sometimes in the store. And I would come home, and it's California, so pretty much any day of the year you can go out in your yard and rip a flower out of the ground. Something's flowering somewhere. I did this whole series of still lives on 5x7 black and white tri just on my living room mantle. I printed several of those as platinum palladium prints. And I need to revisit that series and sort of finish it up as a series and finish print this stack of negatives that I didn't always get to. More recently, I've been shooting 8x10, Like a lot of large format photographers, I kind of get interested in different lenses, so I was trying different things out. So right now, I'm kind of focusing on trying to do more portrait work. I enjoy it. Portraits are interesting and a little bit hard. I mean, sometimes it's a little hard to look at a photograph of a person when you don't know that person. What is this photograph saying to me? Right. And I don't know, but it's an interesting exploration for me. I was a really shy kid, so in the course of working with the Polaroid, I would get calls from Polaroid executives. We've got the president of Mitsubishi in the car. We're going to be there in 10 minutes. You've got time for one photo. It better be good. I mean, I had these situations where we don't want you to bill us for more than one shot either. So they would just come in, and I would have to shoot these portraits. And I would have to hit home runs on all these portraits for people that, in many cases, that I couldn't even talk to because they didn't speak English. And so I really tried to develop my skills as a portrait photographer, and I found that it was really kind of a cool pretext for a shy person to sort of an excuse to sort of talk to somebody and kind of get into their head and share a few moments of reality. So it's really been fascinating. I've really loved doing portraits now. I mean, I do commission portraits both in 20 by 24 and other formats as well. And it's kind of neat to kind of meet these people and quickly sort of try to decode them and figure out what the best picture is you can make of them. And it's an interesting exercise in and of itself. Plus, you get to spend time with another human being, which, I mean, I make it sound like I live in a cave or something, which I don't but I'm really enjoying the world. So let's talk about this portraiture you're doing with the large format. Are you into the F7000 zone where you like to get everything in super depth of field, sharp focus? Are you shooting some old, fast, wide open glass? What do you like to do when you're shooting your large format portraiture? I'm usually much closer to the latter. I like to shoot with fast lenses, not only because they're easy to focus wide open, which is becoming more of an issue as I hit my middle 40s. All of a sudden, I needed reading glasses to focus a view camera, which was a real bitter disappointment to me. I mean, everybody says, oh, yeah, when you hit 45 and your eyesight just goes, and sure enough, it did. I bought a pair of really strong reading glasses, so I don't use a loop when I focus. I just keep these things either on a string around my neck or on top of my head, and I pop them down on my nose and quickly focus and flip them out of the way again, and it's actually pretty seamless. But in answer to your lens question, yeah, I like fast lenses. I don't do deliberate, wacky, selective focus where you just whack the view camera so it looks like a pretzel. But, I mean, selective focus is nice. I mean, I focus on the eyes, and depending on the shot, you stop down more or less depending on what looks good. I mean, my whole philosophy about making pictures is do what looks good. And that changes every time you open the lens. What's going to look good is what looks good right now. But yeah, I've been shooting a little bit with some Voigtlander Healy R lenses, old ones. They're 4.5 wide open, and I don't stop them way down, generally. 
I've got a couple Kodak portrait lenses. I've got the 305 and the 405, which are great for big cameras. They give a really beautiful soft focus look. So I'm enjoying experimenting and playing and just trying to get myself to burn film because sometimes we overthink things and then nothing happens. So I'm trying to keep myself in the routine of making work rather than just thinking about it or talking myself out of it for one reason or another. That's it. You got to go just shoot film. You got to burn it. Doesn't matter what. Just shoot something. Exactly. Art making is a process. I don't think it's a thought process. In many cases, it's a subconscious process. And without something to respond to, first you respond to something in the world or something that you create to exist in front of the camera. And you make that photograph. And when you see it, then you have a chance to gauge your success. And that gives you your guidance on where you go next. It's all about the feedback, which is interesting because that's the thing that I always valued in working with the Polaroid was this instant feedback. And if you sit around and think about a picture you want to take, you never get the feedback. You've got to make the picture. So that's a little bit of philosophy, but it's absolutely true. You never get anywhere until you actually do something. What do you think about portraiture, let's say 35 versus medium versus large format? And even 4x5 over 8x10, what do you think about the aesthetics of shooting portraiture with a large format over medium or 35? Horses for courses. I mean, cameras are tools. We love our Leicas, we love our Hasselblads or our Pentax 6.7s or our 4x5 gallon twin lens cameras or whatever. They're tools for a job, and sometimes you can do amazing work by doing something unexpected, like using a giant camera for sports photography or something. But generally, you can make good portraits with any camera. I mean, be it a half-frame 35 or a digital camera or anything. It's knowing the tool, knowing what the tool is good at and not good at. I like to use a large format camera probably because of long habit. I mean, I've spent so much time behind the ground glass of the 20 by 24 that it's very comfortable for me. I like looking at a large ground glass. I feel like I see well when I look through a big camera. It's very comfortable for me. 4x5, it's great. It's way more portable than a 20 by 24. 8x10 is a good compromise for me. I mean, I used to have a Wisner 14x17 camera, which I really loved. But when I started getting into the camera building thing, I realized I could sell that camera and have enough money to order bellows for several cameras and then make new cameras for myself. So that was a commitment that I made was to sell off that camera that I loved shooting with so that I could build myself more cameras that I would love shooting with, hopefully get something else started. But in answer to your original question, camera's a camera. You don't go to the grand ballroom in your, in your Converse shoes, so you pick the right tool for the job. Let's talk about picking the right tool for the job and Mammoth Camera and what you've been up to here that you have been manufacturing 20x24 20 Polaroid cameras. So if you have the jack, Tracy's got the camera for you. Yeah, well, it's pretty much true. I hope it's true. I grew up as a kid of an engineer. My dad's an engineer. His dad was an engineer. Uh, it was a real do-it-yourself culture. How stuff works is interesting, and to this day, I love understanding how things work. I think it helps make the world go around. I try to be interested a little bit in everything. So when I first moved to California, the camera that I have now, the 20 by 24 hybrid, half Wisner, half Polaroid, a lot of the old parts were broken or in poor repair, and some of the new parts weren't finished or needed to be adjusted or improved because, I mean, this was the first 20 by 24 Wisner had made other cameras, but this is the first time he got his hands on doing something with a Polaroid. So we had to figure out some things on the fly. So when I moved to California, it was August of 97, and we had a grand opening in September, and the camera literally was not working. So over the course of that first month here in California, I had to finish integrating the new parts with the old parts and to get the old stuff running again, because it was quite literally, when we got it out of the box, it didn't work. I had tested the processor in Massachusetts before we shipped it to California, but something happened on the way. I ended up hot-wiring the camera. It had this giant motor controller box that was like the size of a toaster oven. It was this big plywood box with dials and LED readouts on it, and it was junk. So I threw it in the dumpster, and I went to Radio Shack, and I bought a 12-volt transformer, and I pulled a darkroom timer from stock in Calumet, and I just wired the transformer to the darkroom timer to the motor of the camera, and I ran it that way for five years. So in the course of getting that camera up to speed so I could work with clients and do serious work with it, it was a real sort of test of my engineering and manufacturing skills. So a couple of years later, I worked closely with Wisner to help him get going on his 20 by 24 processors. And I had been friends with Steve Grimes back in my Boston days. Steve Grimes, the famous camera repairman, camera modification man. I had been in his shop, so I was gradually just kind of getting more comfortable with envisioning things that don't exist and making them real. So about two or three years ago, I decided to build myself a 20 by 24 camera for film. 
because again, after all these years in the studio, every once in a while you want to take a walk. So I said, well, that's great. I'll build myself a 20 by 24 field camera, and then I can go out in the world and shoot 20 by 24 black and white negatives around the San Francisco area. So I went ahead, and as I said, I sold one of my favorite cameras so I could then afford to order a new bellows for the camera I was about to build, and I just started like that. One or two other things that influenced that were I've been a woodworker for a long time, and for me, the trouble of building a camera was the metal parts. You need to make all these metal fixtures for how the camera folds and latches that hold the camera closed when it's folded up and the springs for the ground glass and the thing that holds the lens board on and all of that. I have a neighbor, actually, who I met walking my dog because he's got a dog, too. He has a factory in San Francisco, and he has a mill where he makes reproduction Victorian woodwork for all the Victorian houses in San Francisco. And at one point, he bought himself an industrial abrasive water jet cutting machine which is this thing that takes up a whole room and it runs off of a computer. You make a drawing in the computer and you feed the drawing to the machine and the machine cuts whatever you drew out of metal. And to do that, it uses water at 60,000 pounds per square inch pressure with abrasive garnet powder. Garnet's the same stuff that they glue to paper to make sandpaper. You mix it with the water and you blast it out at 60,000 PSI and you can cut through steel with it. So I thought, that's it. That's how I'm going to make the metal parts for my cameras, as long as they're flat, because it only cuts sheet goods. So I started designing and came up with some material that I could buy off the shelf and some parts that I could design easily in a CAD drawing program that I taught myself. I had these things cut on the water jet, and I bolted them together, and I put on the bellows that I had made in England. And lo and behold, it's a 20 by 24 camera, and it worked, and it was cool. It was pretty heavy, but it was cool, and it worked. So that was really the beginning of it. So I decided, what the hell? I put up an announcement on my website that I was going to start offering cameras for sale, and that was, I think, 2007. I mean, I've had several inquiries. I've worked on little projects for making people adapter lens boards and things. And then last year, I got this call that a client of the 20 by 24 studio in New York wanted to buy a camera. He had a long-range project, and he wanted to have his own camera because none of us, neither myself nor the New York studio nor the studio in Prague, was able to commit to the time that he wanted to do these portraits in Africa. So I built him a camera to order, and that took from start to finish eight months. I started it September last year and finished it May this year. An absolute brutal project for a one-man shop, but I went through it from start to finish, and at the end, had a working 20 by 24 camera for Polaroid film, and the customer's very happy with it. It works great. We actually took it to Africa for three weeks earlier this summer and did some shooting with it. So we're just looking forward to the next project where I get to go to wherever he goes next. Because he doesn't even want to operate the camera. He just wants his camera and have an expert camera operator to tag along. So it's an interesting approach. A lot of the people who are interested in buying these cameras, they really want to do everything themselves. And this fellow had this interesting idea that, well, I don't need to operate the camera. I can have an expert do that. So camera builder and have camera will travel. There you go. And I'm assuming, too, that if you don't buy a camera, you can still rent the Polaroid camera and it can go on gigs, too. Absolutely. I mean, both the studio in New York and my studio here in California, we're happy to pack up the camera and go to your location. There's always logistical issues. I mean, if you call me tomorrow and say, I want you to bring the camera to Nevada and I'll see you in 48 hours, it doesn't work quite like that because we need to know where we're going. We want to make sure the client to have the best chance of success for their project, especially when it's new customers. The camera, it's a big, heavy thing. It's expensive to ship around. You can ship it overnight, actually, if you've got a lot of money, or usually we ship it a little slower. We end up having to charge for shipping time. We want to make sure that when we get where we're going, that the camera is going to be in a good place where the camera works well. Not like in John's interview, he was talking about shooting in Death Valley. The wind, by 11 o'clock in the morning every day, it was too windy to shoot. I mean, the cameras are finicky. They don't work well everywhere, but they're a fantastic studio camera. And if you want to be somewhere farther afield and you can afford what we need to plan for it, then absolutely, we love going on location and shooting wherever, but we just need to be part of the planning process to make sure you're going to get your shots. Very cool. So where do you see the Mammoth Camera Program going from here? Also, let's chat about your personal photography. Are you all consumed in this large format portraiture? What do you want to do that you haven't got to do yet? That's a really good question, and it's an enduring question. It's the one that I've been struggling with my entire Polaroid career is helping all my other clients make their work. There is more to photography than just helping other people do their work. And after doing so many different kinds of things, from portraiture to location to still life to abstract art, what's in it for me? I mean, there's more than just being engaged in the process. 
that's a question that I ask myself all the time. And that I don't have an answer either means that I'm really shallow or really complicated. I would I say probably I the second. The latter. Yeah, very, very cool. Do you have a personal website and see what you're up to? Let's talk about the big camera. Where can people go look and see what Tracy's up to? Well, I've got two websites. I've got the mammothcamera.com which is the website for renting the 20 by 24 camera and looking at my camera building exploits. And then I also have tracystorer.com, which is a little lean at the moment, but I'm working on getting some interesting old work scanned and up there and hopefully some fresh new work soon. No, this is great work and your photography is beautiful and it's just cool to see you pushing forward with doing this stuff and actually jumping into this progress of building a 20 by 24 Polar camera that's an exact duplicate, but even better and revised and cooler wood. I think if someone has the jack or if they hit the lotto, that it's going to be definitely something they want to do is call up Tracy. Well, it'd be fun to think so, and it's great to be a part of keeping it going. Tracy, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again, chatting more about your photography, this large format portraiture, and all the beautiful stuff you're up to. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, there you go. Tracy Store, mammothcamera.com. Unbelievable craftsmanship. His photography is beautiful. The story behind it. This is just great stuff going on to keep analog photography alive and hopping. This is great stuff, and the only place that you can get true Polaroid instant photography anymore is the 20 by 24 They have film. They got chemicals. They got it all cooking. And, of course, now you can buy a brand new 20 by 24 camera, a legendary piece of equipment. Definitely check out Tracy's website. Just great work he's up to. The Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 over at www.dr5.com. Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com. Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. And, of course, our media partners... APUG, the Analog Photography User Group, over at www.apug.org. Our photography, philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Chipper, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 